What I want to talk about, and I, I, I don't want to get too sort of philosophical, but towards the end I want to say a few words how, how what I'm about to say from a scientific perspective links with my views uh, as a humanist. Uh, but this is essentially a physics lecture. There's no equations, so that's, that's good. Um, but there's a bit of thinking involved uh, along the way. Um, see, the philosophers and theologians and great thinkers throughout history have debated the issue of whether or not we have free will and how that relates to morality and ethics and so on. Um, and in recent years, scientists have got him on the act, whether it were physicists or, or neuroscientists or psychologists, uh, and we're starting to understand a little bit about the nature of consciousness, for example. But we are a long way from having it all clear. So what I'm going to say are my own views on the nature of free will. Um, but they're by no means widely agreed by everyone. But that makes, that makes the debate interesting. But what I want to say from the perspective of physics, I will defend strongly. Uh, but anyway, I welcome questions uh, at the end. So. I want to start with, there, there are worldviews uh, held about the nature of free will, and I'll just list uh, three of them. Um, first of all, there is the view that our fate is literally determined by the stars, the people who read horoscopes and believe that somehow the motion of the stars and planets controls our lives. That's one view. Another is that um, we are more than the sum total of the atoms that make up our bodies. You know, we have souls, we have a mind-body problem, and somehow, uh, you know, we're, we're not just mechanical machines, zombies. There's something else, something other. And then, of course, the, the, the view is that maybe, you know, that our, our fate is already predetermined and it's, uh, and, it's, and it's fixed, but it's noble only to a, a higher power, to God, uh, uh, and so what we think is free, uh, having free choices is all, in any case, known to an omniscient, omnipotent being. Um, of course, the first one, I put a big cross on it, the second one, I put a cross on it, the third one, I put a question mark, because um, <coughs> science isn't in the business of proving or disproving the existence of God. Uh, there's enough metaphysics that I have to sort of try and cope with in quantum mechanics that, uh, that I, I think that the, the issue of, of the existence or not of a, super, of a, a supernatural being is not something that is within the realm of science. Um, I also want to define some technical words so that we all know what, you all know what I'm talking about later on. First of all, this very important word, determinism. And when I say determinism, I mean what's called causal determinism. So this is the idea that things happen and cause other things to happen. So whatever happens in the universe was the result of something else that caused it. And following that chain all the way back suggests that everything is sort of predetermined and fixed because nothing is just going to happen unexpectedly because it has to have a prior cause. Um, and scientists have debated whether or not we live in a deterministic universe. And to some extent, I'm going to say quite a bit about this, this, this point. Then there's randomness. Now, that's the opposite of determinism, indeterminacy. Um, so these are event, you know, events that cannot be predicted. They will happen without a prior cause. And, and, and many physicists will argue that that's what takes place down at the quantum level, the level of subatomic particles. It's, it's, there's indeterminacy there. So that's the opposite of determinism. And then there's something which, in a sense, sits in the middle, which is predictability. Because the point is that you can have a deterministic chain of events, causes and effects, but you can't in advance predict what will happen next. You can look back and say, well, this happened because of that, but I couldn't have guessed that it was going to happen. Okay, so there's a, a, a 
that's to do with our knowledge and our ability to say what's going to happen next. So these, these three words that I'm going to be uh, coming, coming back to throughout the talk. Determinism, randomness, and predictability. Okay. Um, whether or not we have free will, and, and you know, philosophers will see this as very naive and simplistic, but I like, physicists tend to like to keep things as simple as possible uh, in, in order to make sense of them. I'm choosing four options of whether or not to do with determinism, to do with free will. Firstly, that we live in a deterministic universe. Everything is predetermined. Determinism is true. So all our actions, all our predictions are fixed. Therefore, we have no free will. Right? That we, uh, it, it, it's just an illusion. We think we're making free choices, we think we have agency and so on, but actually we're all just part of the atoms of the universe. Um, the second option is determinism is true. Uh, nevertheless, despite that, we still have free will. This is what's called compatibilism in philosophy. Third option, we don't live in a deterministic universe. Things aren't predetermined. The, the, the future of the universe isn't fixed. There's a built-in randomness, whether or not it's quantum mechanics or something else, but it's not uh, uh, ever determined. And that rescues free will. That we can choose to do what we want because the future is open to us. And then there's a fourth option, because I've, I've thought it's sort of true and false. There's two things, each, each one could be true or false. So the fourth option is determinism is false, but despite that, we still don't have free will. Because if events just happen randomly without prior causes, then everything is just random anyway, and we have no more control over what our actions and what's going to happen. Uh, than we did, we did if it was predetermined. So, determinism is, is true, therefore no free will. Determinism is true, but we still have free will. Determinism is false, therefore we have free will. Determinism is false, but we don't have free will. And I'm going to zoom in, hopefully, by the end of the talk on one of these options. We learn physics at school, which is essentially the, the physics of Isaac Newton. So it's a, we live in a clockwork universe. The likes of Newton and Galileo taught us that the universe is one big machine. Forces pushing on bodies, that push back, there's, there's the force of gravity and so on. So everything is, is uh, mechanical. And if you push that to its logical conclusion, we are part of the universe. We are made of the same elements, the same atoms as, as inanimate matter, but arranged in a very special way. And therefore, we are part of this machine of the universe. We are part of the popular universe. And then, what are, what are our thoughts and, and minds? Well, it's there's stuff going on inside a collection of atoms inside our skulls. So it must also be subject to the laws of physics. Um, this is a very bleak <clears throat> picture, but, it's the, but, but that's what the clockwork universe uh, actually means. Um, whether or not we can predict the future is something that scientists and philosophers have thought about, and famously, uh, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace in the 18th century uh, came up with a, a thought experiment. Laplace's demon. It's a, it's a hypothetical, all-powerful um, entity, creature, that can know everything about all the, 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 the stuff of the universe, all the particles that make up the universe. If it understood where everything, all the atoms of the universe were, how they were moving, and the forces between them, then, in principle, it should be able to compute, if it was a powerful enough supercomputer type entity, it could compute all the causes and effects and work out what's happening in the future. So Laplace had this idea that, uh, uh, that the causal determinism meant that 
everything should be knowable in the future. And of course, there, there's a, this leads to a paradox. There's, there's the idea that, well, if imagine it wasn't a demon, let's bring it up to date. Imagine it's uh, some supercomputer that if you fed it information about every particle in the universe, it could compute what's going to happen in the future. But of course, the flaw there is that that machine is part of the universe, and so it would have to also know about the atoms that make it up. And you can easily turn this into a rather nonsensical paradox and say, what if you were to give this computer, this all-powerful supercomputer, the uh, um, command that it should compute all the states of the universe now and work out what's happening half an hour in the future. If in that half, half an hour later in the future it is still running, then it should turn itself off now. Uh, but if it's turned off, then it shouldn't turn itself off. So you, you actually you force a paradox and, and, and the reason that, that that is a paradox is because that computer, that machine, is part of the universe itself. And so, a theist who believes in a supernatural power, there's a logic to say, well, if you're part of space and time, you're part of the universe, then it, of, of course you could never calculate what's going to happen next, because you have to take into account your own, the particles that, that are carrying out the calculation itself. But God outside of space and time isn't part of, of, of the structure, so that, that doesn't exclude God from being omniscient. Um, beyond the clockwork universe, things got, in a sense, even bleaker when Einstein developed his theories of relativity. Um, in 1905, he developed special relativity, uh, that's the one where it says E equals MC squared, and nothing goes faster than light, and time is the fourth dimension. Then he went on to develop the general theory of relativity, but there's a very interesting conclusion that can be drawn from his special theory, which was actually um, pointed out to him by one of his teachers, Hermann Minkowski, in, in, in 1908. He said, if, if time, if we can only understand uh, the, the nature of events and how they determine each other if we make time as the fourth dimension, then we can't talk about space separately and time separately, as, as Newton taught us. Time is, a, is another dimension that has to be mixed up with space. And you see how this is important when objects move close to the speed of light. The weird stuff goes on and, and time slows down and space gets stretched and squeezed. But in terms of the free will and determinism, this leads to what's called the block universe. Because if Einstein, if Einstein you know, and, and if he's right, time is the fourth dimension, then it's just another axis in, in four dimensions. So what do I mean by that? We live in three-dimensional space. We sort of know what three dimensions are. Right? All solid objects are three-dimensional. Um, we're free to move forwards, backwards, left and right, jump up and down. Those are the three axes all right angles to each other, we say they're orthogonal to each other. Well, if time is another dimension, what direction does time go? It's not in any one of the directions within space. It's another line that is right angles to all those lines. And we can't imagine that. We can't imagine four dimensions, because our brains are only three dimensional. So the trick that um, uh, physicists use to try and get across the idea is to say, well, what if our space, our 3D space that we live in, was only two dimensions? What if we were all cardboard cutout figures? If we were just flattened to two dimensions, a, a simpler version of space, then we have the third dimension that we can use for time. It's just it's convenient. So imagine space is a, is a sheet, and time is now an, a line that goes at right angles to space. So this is Einstein's block universe. What does this mean? Well, a slice through it, like a slice of bread in a loaf, is now. A point 
Uh, so on one side is the past, on the other side is the future. Because see, time is running along the axis from left to right. So if this is now, before that is earlier times, after that later times. Um, and there's a point that's the here and now. This turns out to be very, a very useful uh, tool in physics, talking about the block universe. And, and indeed, you know, we know that we live in four-dimensional space-time. It's only an approximation that space and time are separate things. I don't want to give you a lecture on relativity. <laughs> I should have loved to. But the, the point here is that it's even bleaker than Newton's clockwork universe. Newton's clockwork universe just says, you know, everything, the whole universe is just particles interacting, however complicated they might be, everything has a cause uh, and there's an effect to it and everything's deterministic. But, you know, you don't know what the future is going to be like. All you know is you can look back afterwards and Einstein and say, well, that's because of that, because of that, because of that. But in Einstein's block universe, all time is laid out, static, frozen. And so, if you could exist outside of space and time, you could see exactly what would be happening in the future. The future is just as real and fixed as the past, and the present moment is just what we experience, our now. We experience our now because we're stuck inside space-time. But this is very bleak, because this says that if the future is already decided, if everything's predetermined, which is fate, then clearly we have no choice, no freedom to change what's going to happen in the future. It's already, it's already happened, in a sense. Everything that's going to happen, that has happened, all coexist together, frozen the whole of time. This will suggest that, well, that's, that's, I mean, cheer people up at parties and tell them. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything pointless. Don't no bother. Uh, so, you know, let's. Let's think a bit more carefully about what this means, and I, and I certainly want to come to this at the end. Of what does it mean for me as a humanist in terms of morality? You know, can we all just go off and do whatever we want because it's going to happen anyway? What's the point? You know, it's like in the morning. What's the point of revising for my exams? You know, because well, I'm going to pass what was already decided. Um, in the 1920s, of course, quantum mechanics came along. Uh, Einstein had uh, a, a bit part to play in the development of early quantum theory at the start of the 20th century. Um, he, he understood that electromagnetic waves, light, is actually made up of individual lumps, quanta of energy, we now call photons, and he, and, and he turned out that was the correct description to explain certain experiments that people couldn't understand if light was just a wave. But by the 1920s, even Einstein's views were starting to seem outdated. And people like Niels Bohr, uh, and Heisenberg, and Pauli, and Dirac, and so on, the great geniuses of the early 20th century, developed this whole mathematical framework because they realized that down at the very tiny scales, way below anything we can see uh, with the naked eye or even with a microscope, the world is very different. And it isn't Newton's clockwork universe down there. It's actually, things are fuzzy and probabilistic and unpredictable, and particles being in two places at once, and by the 1930s, people putting cats in boxes. You know? <laughs> so, quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I spent my, my career, uh, well, so since I graduated, so okay, 34 years, thinking about quantum mechanics. And it is the most powerful theory. I mean, I know this is Darwin Day. Well, it's actually technically, it's, um, technically Darwin Day is actually on the 12th, but this is the date I could make. <laughs> so, so this is like an, an early Darwin Day. Um, so, I, so I have um, sort of light-hearted arguments with um, uh, biologists and geneticists like Adam Rutherford and others are saying, quantum mechanics is the most important theory in all of science. Right? More important than uh, Darwin and evolution through natural selection. Um, because quantum mechanics underpins 
the nature of reality itself. Without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't understand most of physics, all of chemistry, maybe even biology. Certainly, we wouldn't have electronics, we wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't have most of the technological devices that we take for granted today. All of them are, are, are only possible because we have an understanding of how the subatomic world behaves. But one of the most profound predictions physicists will tell you about the quantum world is that it brings back indeterminism. It says Newton's clockwork universe, that everything is, is fixed and determined and predicted in advance, and or can be in principle predicted in advance, is wrong. Because quantum mechanics frees us again. It says, you know, um, a radioactive atom, which is going to spit out, say, an alpha particle, you know, we can work out, if we have trillions of atoms, we can work out what their half-life is. So it's, say, you know, within six weeks, three days and two hours, half this material will have radioactively decayed away. So each atom has spat out, or atomic nucleus, has spat out another particle, and that stuff has changed into some, something else. Um, but when it comes down to individual atomic nuclei, we cannot predict when it's going to split out an alpha particle. It's unpredictable. Heisenberg's uncertainty. There's, okay, there's Heisenberg. No, that's, that's Heisenberg. My joke. <laughs> but people haven't seen Breaking Bad before. Um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says we are. It's impossible for us to know, if, you know in Newton's clockwork universe, for Laplace's demon to even start doing his stuff and calculating how a system would evolve, it needs to know where everything is very precisely and how fast it's moving and the forces and so on. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says no. An individual particle, say an electron, you can work out where it is precisely, but you have to give up any hope of knowing how fast it's moving or what direction it's moving at that moment in time. Or you can work out how fast it's moving, what direction it's moving, but then you won't know where it is at that moment in time. Okay, so physicists have said deter indeterminism of the quantum world rescues free will. I have two things to say about that. One is that quantum mechanics is not necessarily indeterministic. The behavior of the quantum world is unpredictable. We are unable to know. We can never set up an experiment to measure at the same time where a particle is and how fast it's moving. Right? But that doesn't mean it doesn't have a position and momentum when we're not looking. Quantum mechanics is unique among the theories of science, in that we haven't yet settled on an explanation. We call it a, a, an interpretation. The story that we tell that describes the mathematics. The mathematics of quantum mechanics is brilliantly powerful. It makes predictions. It allows us to understand the structure of, of the world of the small. But what does it all mean? We've got a dozen different ways of explaining what it all means. The founding fathers, Bohr and Heisenberg and Wolfgang Pauli and others, um, would have us believe that everything's cut and dried, the world is indeterministic at the subatomic, at the quantum level. But actually, these days, a large fraction, for example, a large fraction of physicists subscribe to a particular explanation of, of quantum mechanics called the many worlds interpretation which, if you've heard of it, you may know something about it. If you haven't, it'll sound ludicrous. And, and the idea is that every time at the quantum level, a particle, say, is faced with a choice, the universe splits in two. So the famous Schrodinger's cat in the box, which is in the box with the radioactivity and the poison, and the box is closed for, 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 for an hour, say, in, in the popularization of quantum mechanics, we're told 
You don't know if that cat is dead or alive because its fate is, is controlled by whether or not that atom has spat out an alpha particle which has released the poison which has killed the cat. If the atom hasn't itself decided when, whether or not it's released the, 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 the alpha particle, quantum mechanics says it exists in two states simultaneously. It has both spat out the alpha particle and hasn't spat out the alpha particle. Therefore, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. So it's not that before you open the box, you say, I don't know if it's dead or alive at the same time. It's just my ignorance. No, the cat really is in some limbo state. Sch Schrodinger came up with this example to show how crazy quantum mechanics was, not because he was trying to prove it. Um, but what does it have to do with determinism? Well, there are versions of quantum mechanics, like the many worlds interpretation, and there are other versions, uh, called realist versions of quantum mechanics, which are perfectly valid. All the maths is exactly the same. It's just the story attached to the maths differs. In some of those stories, the universe is deterministic. The, the, uh, the subatomic world, there's no indeterminism, there's just unpredictability. That's what the math tells us. Beyond unpredictability is the interpretation we impose on it. And we don't know what is the correct interpretation. And that is one of the big bugbears of physicists for the last hundred years, that this is the only theory in science that seems to have got away with not having a unique interpretation. No other theory works or would be a valid scientific theory if you couldn't explain what it means. So that's one argument against quantum mechanics giving us back our free will. The other argument is to say that even if quantum mechanics is indeterministic, the atom by itself can never, uh, doesn't know when it's going to spit out the, the particle. When, it's, when you zoom out to trillions of atoms, particularly those that make up the the neurons and the cells and, and, and the, the structure of our brains, where if free will exist would be where it sits, then these quantum indeterministic, you know, the fuzziness, the probabilistic nature gets washed out. It's just statistical. And so quantum indeterminism doesn't actually influence the macro world, the world, the world where free will exists. So either of those two arguments as I'm concerned, says the quantum mechanics, if you're looking to rescue free will because of quantum mechanics, saying nothing is predictable in the future, then I think that isn't a very strong argument. So, can we know then, you know, if, you know, I know I've talked about Laplace's demon uh, uh, that's part of the universe, but can we in principle know with infinite knowledge in, within our space-time, can we know the future? If the universe really is deterministic. Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, another brilliant French mathematician, a bit later than Laplace, discovered something about the deterministic clockwork universe of Newton that hadn't been obvious before. Apparently, the story goes that the king of Sweden had, for some reason, started to worry about the stability of the solar system. So he'd, he'd, read, he'd read about, uh, you know, planetary orbits and going, all going around the sun and these stable orbits. And he must have had a moment of crisis. They were, yeah, but what if suddenly the Earth floats off into deep space and we don't have the sun to keep us warm? Can anyone, and I will give a prize of I don't know how many krona, to who, whichever mathematician can persuade me that the solar system is, is stable. Well, Boncare decided to uh, have a go at this and very quickly realized that the solar system is a rather complicated, you know, there are too many bodies involved, all pulling each other gravitationally. It's probably said, simplify it down, just the sun, the moon, and the earth. If all that existed was the sun, the moon, and the earth, can we solve the equations of motion for those three bodies and prove that uh, it's deterministic and evolve it into the future? 
And he realized it's impossible. You cannot, even with three bodies, let alone all the particles in the universe, even with three bodies, you cannot, you can predict what's going to happen subject to certain initial conditions. If the Earth is here, the Moon is there, the Sun is there, I can make that evolve into it, crank that the mathematical handle and work out how they're going to evolve in the future. Most of, most of these just boring orbits, right? Um, but we know, for example, you know, over the course of billions of years, uh, is it the moon's getting closer to the Earth? I think that's, I think that's what's, what's happening that way around. Oh, going away. Is it going, it's going further away from the Earth? Right, okay. So it's not completely stable, but um, Trancari's point was the three-body problem doesn't, cannot be solved exactly. You have to come up with some simplifying approximations. So what if, you know, so, so the, let's have a few more bodies. A game of pool. What if you, you know, you, you, you hit the cue ball, you scatter the, all the other balls, they bounce into each other, bounce off the side cushions, and then try, I mean, in practice, this can't be done, right? This is another false experiment. What if you were, you were to try and repeat that same shot again with precisely the same force, hit the cue ball exactly in the same place, hit the, the, the ball in the pack, etc. Can you reproduce the scatter of all the balls exactly the same as before? The answer is no, you can't. Because to do that, you would have to know the position of the balls each ball to infinite accuracy. I mean, just to give you a simple example, a, a one single speck of dust may cause, on, on one of the balls, may cause it to deviate from its path by a nanometer. But the next ball it hits would be deviated by slightly more. The next ball it hits slightly more. So you, you very quickly end up with something very different. And we cannot know those initial conditions to infinite accuracy. This, this wasn't something that um, Poincaré figured out. In fact, it, it took a meteorologist, uh, Lorenz, who worked at MIT, um, to actually realize this because he was studying the weather and he realized that uh, we cannot know the conditions of, of every atom, every molecule of air uh, around the Earth and, and, and work out exactly what's going to happen in the future. And he coined the butterfly effect. The idea is that, yes, you know, our uh, Met Office supercomputers can predict with some reliability, maybe more so in Manchester, if with the possibility of rain. <laughs> yes, it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, but, you know, with some reliability, that what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, maybe even next week. But they think you're crazy if you ask them to predict with a degree of confidence whether it's going to rain on this date next year. Because the further you go into the future, the more important those initial conditions are. We cannot know everything there is to know about the Earth and, and the, the sea and, and the air and the winds and everything to predict with certainty. The, the further you go into the future, the... the, the, the less good your prediction is going to be. So this then led to a whole new field of physics, which isn't Newtonian mechanics, it's not Einstein's relativity, it's not quantum mechanics, it's chaos theory. David mentioned chaos theory. Um, uh, I made a uh, documentary about this BBC Four about 10 years ago. And, and essentially chaos theory just says that the future is unpredictable because we cannot know the present to infinite accuracy. It's almost back to Laplace's demon. So the unpredictability due to not being able to know everything with infinite accuracy sort of gets added to the unpredictability of the quantum world. So somehow I'm, I'm, I'm now converging on this idea that unpredictability is somehow important. But we're talking about free will. We're talking about agency and consciousness, sense of self. Uh, we are living things. And I haven't mentioned the connection between all these physicists talking about particles bumping into each other 
What has that got to do with, with life? And what is special about life? Over the last 20 years or so, gradually building up, I've started to get more interested in a new interdisciplinary field called quantum biology. In fact, I saw some of my Life on the Edge books on sale outside. Um, they're very good. <laughs> um, quantum biology says that there, there are certain phenomena and mechanisms within living cells that wouldn't work without a helping hand from quantum mechanics. Now, that doesn't mean that we are made of atoms and atoms are quantum mechanical. After all, if you say quantum physics is the foundation, basis of reality, quantum physics would explain organic chemistry, organic chemistry scaled up in complexity becomes molecular biology, which is life. So in a sense, well of course, we must depend on the rules of quantum mechanics because we're made of, ultimately, dig down deep enough, we're made of particles that are subject to the rules of quantum mechanics. But I, mean, I said earlier that that gets washed out because that's just sort of statistics. Is life different somehow? Could it be possible that life can reach down to the quantum world and capture any indeterminacy that, that gives us back our free will? Certainly, it's true that living organisms are the only macroscopic, complicated objects in the universe whose overall behavior can be controlled by a single quantum event, a mutation. A single hydrogen atom jumping from one strand of DNA to the other, subject to the rules of quantum mechanics, can cause a mutation when those DNA uh, uh, strands separate and, and replicate, and that mutation can lead to a very different outcome to the, to the organism itself. Well, possibly. But if quantum mechanics is, is, is this random, unpredictable, in, or even indeterministic <laughs> process, then I don't see how that in any way helps when you build it up to the, to the point, to the stage of a brain and, a, and, a, and consciousness and say, well, because quantum mechanics is unpredictable and indeterministic, therefore that rescues us from, uh, rescues our free will. I don't think it does. So I've been through various topics in physics to try and convince you that in all likelihood we actually do live in a deterministic universe. Cause follows uh, precedes effect, effect follows cause. Well, in a deterministic universe, if all that's happening is everything in it is obeying the laws of physics because of what happened before, then it sort of follows that we are puppets and that we're just following the laws of physics. So therefore, you know, where, where can free will hide? We might as well be lines in a, in a simulated universe. On, on that issue, or whether possibly we could be a simulation, I think it's a load of nonsense. <laughs> I mean, it, you can sort of, this, you can, it's absolutely absurd, and you can really say, well, if, if we are a simulation, then we're, we're, we're coded on some supercomputer or some other beings. That, you know, they, they're just, we're just a virtual reality world that they are producing. Well, they may be, therefore, if we're a simulation, there's just as like, it's likely that they are simulation of some even higher beings who are also a simulation, and then you can just go all forever. So the whole thing collapses. It's just absurd. We're not a simulation. Um, so, where do, we, where do we stand then? Well, a physicist's view, this physicist's view, um, despite the possible indeterminacy of the quantum world, I don't think that scales up to give indeterminism that would give us free will. I don't, I don't think quantum mechanics helps us. So, we live in a deterministic universe, even if at the quantum level there's, there's indeterminism going on, but I'm, I'm sort of, in, in science you're not, you're not supposed to talk about I believe this or I believe that, that's, that's not the way science works. Uh, but the problem with quantum mechanics is because we don't have an agreed-upon interpretation of what's going on, 
Physicists tend to fall into camps, and they will have arguments and dogmatic you know, discussions no different to, to philosophical or theological debates, uh, which isn't really the way science should work. But if I were to put myself in one camp, I'd say, well, I think even at the quantum level, there's determinism. But there's this chaos business, right? The idea that we cannot predict the future because we cannot know the present with infinite accuracy. I think there's hope there. The, the idea that we could never know the future with accuracy because we cannot know, cannot know the present with, with, with accuracy, then, then that, that sort of means the future to us is open. We can't predict it. This sort of gives us, I'd say, the illusion of free will. A lot of, uh, and a lot of um, scientists, psychologists, neuroscientists are, are much more gung-ho. They just say, no, forget it. We don't have free will. I'm, I'm, I think the illusion, when I say the illusion of free will, I, I sort of mean maybe we have free will, but it's not the free will that we think it is. You know, to sort of move the goalposts and redefine it. Um, so this is sort of my, um, I'll say a few more, so I'm not finished just yet, but sort of a concluding, bringing together what I mean. Even, we, even though we live in a deterministic universe, the future is fixed, right? It's just simply not knowable to us, but it's impossible for us to compute it. And that being not knowable to us, I think in some sense gives us that some free will. Determinism kills free will in a very um, well, a, a scientific view would be that you cannot possibly have a, an open future if the future isn't open. If it's all preordained, if it's all predetermined, may not be noble to us, but it's all predetermined, then somehow we cannot have free will. But unpredictability for us, I, you know, I cannot predict what you're going to do next because I cannot know with enough accuracy what every one of the billions upon billions of neurons in your brain, how they're firing and how they're connected. And, and I cannot know with infinite accuracy. I would also have to know every event and every past experience that shaped to make you who you are throughout your life, plus everything that shapes everyone who's preceded you because that would have uh, affected uh, your genetic makeup. I cannot even know my own self what I'm going to do next because I cannot know every particle in my brain, what, what, how they're going to interact. And, and, and so that's un the unpredictability of what's going to happen next gives us this illusion of free will. So the choices that we, we make, while God outside the universe, uh, or a supreme quant a quantum computer that knows everything that sits outside of space-time, or some being from a parallel universe that sees just our little, cozy little uh, universe is quite quaint, they might be able to see what's going to unfold in the future. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look, look at that, he's going to do that next. Oh, yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> but for us, within, embedded within space time, we can never predict it. So for all intents and purposes, our future is open to us. What we, with the choice that we make is, as far as we're concerned, a free choice. But our actions determine, you know, the, as far as we're concerned, there's an infinite number of possibilities in the future. When I say the future is open, I mean there's, there's an infinite number of ways, paths that things can evolve. Now, if we had the power of Laplace's demon, we say no, there's only one possible path. The deterministic universe says things will cause things, other things to turn out the way they are. But we can't know that. Therefore, for us, the future is open. I, I used the word compatibilist at the beginning. Now, a compatibilist, compatibilism is the belief that free will and determinism are both true. That despite living in a deterministic universe, somehow 
uh, we have free will. There have been some famous compatibilists, so you know, if I were a compatibilist, I'd be in good company. There's, there's Zeno, the, the, the chap with the paradoxes, and, and the Stoics of the 3rd century BC. Thomas Aquinas was a capitalist. Capital, um, capitalist. <laughs> you might not be a capitalist, I don't know. Um, and the, the, uh, the American philosopher, Daniel Dennett, is also a compatibilist. Now, it may be that part of my views have been tainted by the fact that when I was a student, I read Dennett's Consciousness Explained, which like, blew me away. You know, he, you know, he, he, he talked about the nature of consciousness, the nature of free will. And, oh, God, yeah, yeah. He's one of those writers, you know, like Stephen Pinker and Richard Dawkins, where begrudgingly you read their books, and, yep, 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 I'm doing that. <laughs> Ask me, but what you're saying, I can't find fault with what you're saying. So Daniel Dennett w w is a modern-day compatibilist. But even Daniel Dennett will say, if you think we live in a deterministic universe, but somehow our sense of self, our, our, our uh, consciousness, our free will is separate from the laws of physics, no, forget it. We are part of the universe. We are still made of atoms. We're still yeah, subject to the laws of physics. But even Daniel Dennett will say, if there is free will, it's not the sort of free will that you think it is. It seems to be a bit of a cop-out. Um, and, and the reason why I think it's important to find a cop-out is because the, the bleak view that we live in a deterministic universe and everything's preordained and fixed and we don't have free will flies, certainly flies in the face of what a humanist would, would how the humanist sees the world. Yeah, the, the, the humanist, so, so almost our motto is you don't need God to be good. Right? The, the, uh, our moral compass, our ethics, are because we, as humans, choose to want to do the right thing. Now, that's not to say that if you're a theist, somehow uh, you're forced to do the right thing because you're, you're, you're told. Well, you know, there are many religions that, that will, you know, you, the way you act is because it's, it's written in, in, a, in a book that you should do this, or you do something in a certain way uh, because you want to please your God, or because. Um, you don't want to be punished if you do the wrong thing, but that's to do disservice to, to people for whom their faith is very important. And uh, having a religious faith doesn't mean that you, you don't want to do good things because you're a human being. But, but it's, a humanist will say, no, it's, it, it's all entirely down to what I choose, by my, my conscience, my empathy, my compassion, my moral code is down to who I am, I, uh, what I, how I choose. And that sort of grates against the idea that there is no free will. Right? You know, if, if we're only made of atoms that are interacting and, and forces that could be in principle calculated, uh, is, then, you know, what, what is that when someone commits a, commits a murder? So, well, you know, it's nothing to do with me. Clearly, the atoms in my body interacted, in my brain interacted in a certain way that, that forced me to carry out that, that crime. Not my um, and, and, and we can't live as a society like that. But, but there's the danger that the scientists, you know, the, 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 the physicists, neuroscientists, psychologists would say, we know, we know there's no free will in the terms of but, you know, that, that the rest of you, uh, no, no, you shouldn't, you know, uh, you should still be, behave yourselves despite the fact that you're just philosophical zombies or whatever it is that they refer to. That's, that's patronizing and condescending. And so we do, you know, if we are to understand what makes us special, why we choose to have ethics, why we choose to have morality, why we choose to behave in a certain way, that forces us to, to be them. We must have some freedom to choose how we act in life. There has to be agency. And I think, and it's not something that is understood properly yet. But there is this growing notion that agency, um, a sense of self, sentience, consciousness, 
emerges from nothing more than the laws of physics and, and subatomic particles. But it, it's, so if there isn't anything more than physics and chemistry, there isn't some magic pixie dust that sprinkled on the brain that brings about sentience and free will and, and consciousness. It's, it's all there, it's all part of the, the universe. But we cannot just dismiss free will and consciousness and sense of self by saying we live in a deterministic universe. And I think that's what compatibilists would argue. Modern day compatibilists, and I probably would put myself in that in that category then. Modern day compatibilists would say, well okay, we probably do live in a deterministic universe. But that future is not knowable to us. It's still open to us. We are still the way we behave, the way we act, for all intents and purposes, is as though we have absolute free choice in what we do, what we say, and how we behave. There are, there are many psychologists, neuroscientists, who say we're now looking to see where, where is the seat of, of agency, where is, where is that you in, inside the, the brain, what, you know, what is it affecting me? It's called the hard problem uh, in philosophy, because it's hard and no one's figured it out yet. Um, <laughs> But we're sort of gradually trying to bring together the different ideas from different areas of science and philosophy to try and, and, and crystallize these ideas. And I think we're moving towards trying to um, accommodate a new definition of free will, even though we are nothing more than the atoms, nothing more than, than, than stardust. Spat out by, by supernova and then got all clumped together and made the earth. And, you know, we're, it's a sort of poetic uh, picture of what we're made of, but there's nothing more that's special in terms of our building blocks. But that sort of simplistic reductionist view, I think, doesn't help us understand what free will is. I think I'll stop there. I was, I'll just start repeating myself. Thank you very much. <laughs>I'm a scientist, so I, I think that intellectual responsibility requires me to accept or reject some hypothesis based on the evidence. But how can we be rational, intellectually responsible agents if we have ultimately no control over our thoughts and our conclusions? Well, we, we have no control in the sense that we cannot see the future. We, 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 is it, we have no knowledge of the future, but that doesn't mean we, we don't have control over, over the, the present. Our, our, we know that particular actions would lead to particular outcomes. Now, at the end, you can look back and say, well, I was always going to do that because it's a deterministic universe. But back at the time when you're projecting forward and saying, can I do this or should I do that, I am free to make those choices to, to a, a large extent. So I don't think... The, the possible, even if there's an infinite number of, of possible futures options, as I see it, even even if you know whether one of them is already predetermined as viewed from outside of space time, or whether everything is random and in, indeterministic, for me now I still feel I have agency to. to, to to pick an option or that the control I have is to make make to make to make the choices. People will say, "Well, that the, the choices that you make are just illusory." You know, you could do these these tests where you know you you've, uh, the, the signal that you're going to pick your hand up and scratch your nose is, is picked up on a, on an instrument half a second before you actually do it, and that sort of blows your mind. You knew I was going to do something in advance, but that just suggests that. The, the, the seat of consciousness of agency is not fixed in the brain. It's something that emerges, it's something that's probably spread around large parts of, of the brain. I don't think that has that. But I still think, you know, if we have, if we have a choice to, uh, of, of various options, then that, for me, that's what I say control. I have control over what I do. 
Um, I just wondered what your interpretation of quantum mechanics is in terms of many worlds, realist or idealist. Ah. And, uh, sorry, and also, if you're an idealist, does that mean that the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics is just eradicated as a point in itself because it's just a means of the maths? Yeah, um, on the 10th of February, uh, I'm on uh, Brian Cox and Robin Linz's Infinite Monkey Cage with Sean Carroll. I don't know if people know Sean Carroll, cosmologist at Caltech, another humanist. Um, Sean Carroll is a very, very strong advocate of many worlds interpretation. He loves it to bits. And my argument is just because it's simple doesn't make it right. Because, you know, with all due respect to theists, a non-theist like me will say, well, if you're going to go for simplest and be happy, then you say, well, God made it that way. Now, that isn't, that isn't what a religious person would argue. You know, they're, they're not naive enough to think, you know, uh, you've got to make it that way, and I don't want to discuss things. They think deeply about <laughs> these issues. But that simple doesn't mean correct. So many worlds, for me, is, is cheap on assumptions, but too expensive on universes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I still believe in a deterministic interpretation. I don't know. I'm, I, I really am agnostic about interpretation, but if I had a, a favorite that I really liked, that I want to be true, I guess it would be De Broglie-Bohm theory, pilot wave theory, Bohmian mechanics. That's deterministic, and it's just that one universe, uh, and, but there's some hidden variables underneath what we know. That, that, that's possible. So, so I think even at the quantum level, chances are everything is deterministic, but unpredictable. We, can, we cannot know where our particles have our scale. So indeterminism is just something that has been added on, bolted on to the mathematics of quantum mechanics by the founding fathers who were very persuasive uh, and took several generations for, for us to free ourselves. So, well, yeah, maybe Niels Bohr wasn't right. <gasps> I'm just wondering if I've got a grip on this, that right from a particle point of view, uh, right from the particle situation, that there are so many alternatives that each particle can do, that by the time you get to an action from all of history, going back forever, through all the everything, um, that that's why it can never be predictable. Things can never be predictable. It's because there are so many particles. And so many choices at each. Well, each particle may be, may be very, each particle may be, have a very simple choice. You know, if it's an electron orbiting around an atom, it could be spinning one way or the other. It's quantized. It doesn't have, you know, it can only have one energy or another energy and not the energies in between. So it may be for, for its individual particles, there aren't that many choices. But trillions and trillions of them together to make up, uh, you know, the proteins and molecules and cells and, and brains. Any individual uncertainty or indeterminism gets washed out and averaged out so that the actions about you know, whether or not I scratch my nose, that is not down to whether one neuron fired or not, or, or, or one electron moved one way or the other. I'm, I'm not coming at it from a physicist's point of view, okay. so um, ju just whether or not the, the illusion of free will actually changes things to the extent that then a different outcome plays out in the future? Um, I, I don't know, I mean, you, you have to think, so it's not just, we don't just talk about humans having free will, but other animals have free will as well. You know, a dog could choose to bark or not bark, wag its tail or not, go left or right, and all the way down to, you know, so agency and a sense of self or doing something or other, uh, I think is available to, to a lot of life forms. Uh, I don't know how far down we want to go, uh, plants, um, but, but, but you very quickly lose the, the notion of whether it's free will or the illusion of free will or, you know, that, that we, you know, dogs and, and, or lower animals and that are not kidding themselves that they, they, they have choices, they just have choices, they don't think about it. And, and, and it's, the same, it's the same with things like consciousness. You know, consciousness doesn't switch on. 
there's no light that's on or off. It's, it's emergence. Yeah, and so it just gets dimmer and dimmer as you move down to the simpler organisms. You have this question that our free will is only like thoughts we have, but we only take actions according to our environment and requirements. The only free will I guess we have is like the way we can only think like I dream to have a nice car, but it's just a thought in my head. But according to my circumstances, I don't have the free will at all. I need to act according to circumstances and requirements. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, our freedom to make choices is obviously constrained by our, our environment and, and, and our personality and, and our means to whether or not to buy a, a car. When I talk about free will, I mean our conscious choices. I mean, there's a lot of sub, uh, unconscious things that go on in the brain. And it's much easier just to say, well, that's nothing to do with free will. You know, the fact that my brain tells my lungs to keep breathing, I'm not thinking about it, or tells my heart to keep pumping. That's not nothing to do with free, free will. That's not about agency and choice. Uh, so it is only those choices that we can reflect upon and, and, and see ourselves doing uh, that, that free will deals with. But, yeah, but, but it's, you're not free to do anything, you know, that, that there are lots of constraints on what we can or can't do. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, the, we determine time by mathematical calculations, like half-life of some item or something, or evolution takes this much time to change it to a different form. Is there any other way we can think of time other than mathematical calculation? Any theory or anything we can think of time other than the mathematical? Yep. Oh. Listen, time has not been, what time is, we have no idea. The, the, the three uh, main pillars of physics, quantum mechanics, relativity theory, and thermodynamics, three, they're basically the three areas of physics. Each one of them has a different definition of what time is. So relativity says time is a dimension. It's the fourth dimension. It's uh, direction in four dimensions space time that you can map out and plot the universe. Quantum mechanics says no time is just a, a parameter, a number. You put in a value for time in, in Schrodinger's equation, crank the handle, and you can work out what an electron is likely to be doing, probability of being in one place or another in the future. But you could run the equation backwards and work out what it was doing in the past. So time can go in either direction in the quantum realm. So it's, it's, a, it's a number that can be, you can change the sign. Then with dynamics, it's not a dimension, it's not a number, it's an arrow. It points from past to future uh, because thermodynamic, thermodynamics is the most, one of the most powerful concepts of physics is the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which says that uh, things decay, they unwind, they become more mixed up, more messy. Uh, it's to do with a concept called entropy. That you start off with entropy is, is to do with order. So when entropy is small, that means something's very ordered, like a pack of cards that hasn't been shuffled. <coughs> As you shuffle the cards, they become more messed up. Entropy increases. So that tells you there's an arrow that entropy uh, increasing says the shuffled pack happened later than the unshuffled. An easier example is that you, know, you put milk in your coffee and stir it up. The stirred up white coffee is more disordered than the, the black coffee and the milk that are separate. You don't see coffee unmixing into black and, and, and white. It all, always only goes in one direction. Broken eggs don't jump up from the ground and reconstitute themselves and so on. So then we access time is a, is a direction. So these are our three most important notions in physics, and if we want to arrive at some um, glorious theory that encompasses all physical phenomena in the universe, we have to combine all these three theories. Not just, by the way, not just gravity and quantum mechanics, we need thermodynamics in there as well. But until we figure out what time is, you know, which one of them is going to win? Because, you know, the other two are going to have to concede. So is quantum mechanics not quite right? Is Einstein's relative not quite right? Is the thermodynamics not quite right? We don't know. So, in a sense, I'm sort of jumping the gun talking about the nature of free will, because it's like 
fun, I like the sound of my own voice, but actually, physicists don't even know what time is, so maybe we should start there first. Um, at what point does, say, choice say we have free will and uh, randomness? At what point does the choice go from being free will to being randomness? See, this is the problem. People talk like this. <laughs> well, it's my own fault. You know, stuff. Deep ideas, and then clever people in the audience hit me with. At what point does freedom become randomness? Well, I think, in a sense, our, our free will, whatever it is, 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 is our means as organized structures of atoms and molecules to stop randomness from happening. Uh, if, if, using the example of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics says the randomness, the, the untidiness, the disorder of the universe grows. It's, it started from the Big Bang when, for whatever reason we don't understand, it was very ordered, and by the end of the, the life of the universe, everything will be just the disorder, completely mixed up. But life is a, is a system that maintains order. We are able to maintain low entropy, and that's because we we eat low entropy energy. <laughs> the food that we eat, which comes from sunlight, which is low entropy energy from the sun, uh, and that we, we maintain. We're more than steam engines, right? You know, we're, we're not just give me energy and I can carry out work. So the fact that we can maintain high uh, high order, low entropy, uh, and then if our free will, which is the, the whatever's going on inside our brains is, is part of this system of life, then it is part of this ability to maintain order. So all the time we have free will, it therefore follows that we must, or, or during the time we have free will, must, we must have a um, sense of self and sentience and consciousness, which means we're, we're living, uh, and, and then that means we, we have this ability to, to stave away complete disorder. I'm sort of, sort of proud of that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm but probably on reflection if I watch it afterwards. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm fam fascinated about this uh, many worlds idea. Um, where, let's imagine you've got somebody going down a road and he's got the choice of going either taking a left turn or a right turn. Yeah. Right. So when he gets to that point where he's, where he's making that decision, he creates two new separate universes. Right. So once those two universes have been separated, is there, is there any way that one of those universes could either communicate with the other? No, according to many worlds theory, no. That's it. They're, they're, they're forever right. separated. In one universe he went left and the other universe he went right. Yeah. Um, in the university where he went left, he said, I had free will, I had a choice, and I chose to go left. And in the other one, I had free will, I had a choice, and I chose to go right. But because they can never communicate with each other, say, hang on a minute, no, no, that, I chose to go right. No, you didn't. No, I didn't. I chose to go left. Because they're separated, it's somehow, there's no conflict. So, uh, and this is meant to be happening all the time down at the scale of individual subatomic particles. What would your reaction be to when you get the, the ball hassling you in the party about this is all just an example of the naturalistic fallacy? Would it, is it a Lawrence Krauss type response of this is just philosophers being silly? Or is there some response you can give to the accusation of being engaged in the naturalistic fallacy? Um, well, I. I love to engage on. I mean, I certainly don't subscribe to the um, the view that philosophy is dead. And you know, sorry, leave it to this. You've not made any progress in a few hundred years, and we're we're all we're doing all the deep thinking. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Philosophy is vitally important, and certainly the the uh, the great thinkers in in physics, certainly the, the Einsteins and Niels Bohr's of, of, of the early 20th century had a steep education in philosophy. They really un understood the questions. And philosophy is all about 
finding the right questions to ask, the scientists to try and answer, to crystallize the, 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 the fog that scientists can some, sometimes find themselves in. Um, but, but I, because I'm not a philosopher, I'm, I, I, I'm not familiar with the, the, the cut and thrust of how you debate philosophical issues. So when a philosopher would ask me that sort of question, I don't feel qualified to, to debate. I, I give them the respect that I need to understand your, your points of view. I need to go and find out what other philosophers who don't agree with you might say, and then make a decision on which I find the more appealing argument. I wouldn't argue for the sake of arguing, but I would give respect to philosophers because I think they are very important. I think physicists now are starting to appreciate that, to some extent, there have been several books written recently, that certainly in, in fundamental physics, in theoretical physics, physicists have been so in love with the, the fact that they can develop mathematical models of reality, they've forgotten what their job is. You know, the, 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 so the philosophers, they, they don't just the philosophers, they do the deep thinking, they don't look, look at the experimentalists or the engineers who could develop the, the tests of their ideas. So I think physicists need to, are, are now starting to think, well, okay, we, we've reached a point where we don't seem to be making progress. Maybe we should go back and listen to, to the philosophers again and, and see if they can help us formulate more sensible questions. Going back to something I wish, I'm sure you wish you'd never brought up, which was the many worlds theory. And thinking about that in the light of entropy, which as I understand it, is basically just things that are separate getting mixed up yes. as we move forward. Yet the idea of the many worlds is that the worlds split and get more separated. So surely if we look at it like that, we're kind of going backwards through time as everything splits up and becomes more separate, sort of being all meshed together like it began with. Well, the, I mean, the, the second law of thermodynamics talks about the, 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 the structure of space and time and the stuff within it, within a universe. The, the, the many worlds theory is, is more metaphysical than that. You, you, these are not realities in the sense that somehow, if you've got two universes, you've doubled the amount of matter and energy. Uh, they are different realities that somehow coexist. Uh, so it's quantum physics, everything is quantum and Yeah, and, 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 and the, you, you get people, if when I say quantum mechanics is weird, I get, get told off by people who say, no, that's not the way we try and understand it. Just by calling it weird somehow is, is doing a disservice to it. But, it, but it's, yeah, uh, you know, many, 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 there was a, there was a paper recently, recently, the last year or two, which was a, like a sophisticated Uber Schrodinger's cat type uh, thought experiment, which involved a cat and then a scientist getting the, 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 uh, the signal from the cat who was also inside a larger box. And there was another cat in another size of another, and they were sending signals to each other. And it was, but, it was a, but whichever, and they said, this is the experiment that will tell us which interpretation of cosmic cat is right. And then whatever interpretation you subscribe to, you found that experiment as proof that your interpretation was right. <laughs> so we, we, we still don't know, and I'm still, my sort of ambition is that, look, nature behaves in a certain way. Either there are parallel universes or there aren't. Either there are hidden variables there or there aren't. I, you know, either the moon is there when I'm not looking or it's not. Um, nature behaves in a certain way. We have got an embarrassment of different ways of telling the story of what's going on. That's our fault. We don't, we don't blame nature for, well, it could be this or it could be that. We, should, we may never know what the correct interpretation is, but there is a correct interpretation, because this is a scientific theory. Jim, thank you very much for uh, tonight's lecture. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, do you have a message 
now that you've finished the entire event for the audience who will now be watching this on YouTube at a later date? Well, I mean, the, the subject matter wasn't straightforward. So I, I, so I was thinking on my feet giving the talk, but then after, I mean, the questions uh, really got me thinking. So my, my message is, Please be kind, because if I say if I sound like I'm rambling, you know, it's because I'm I'm still trying to figure some of this stuff out myself. This is not an easy subject, but I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm sure most people, if not everyone, thought you did very well. And do you have a final message for the organise the humanist group, Greater Manchester humanist group, who organised tonight's event? Well, I mean, it's fantastic. I've, I I'm not sure I've ever spoken to the Greater Manchester humanist group before. But I mean, huge audience. If if the if if I mean, s sign up those who are not signed up, right? So I, so I think I, the the message is clear. This it's very vibrant. Humanism seems to be very vibrant in Manchester. I'm going to go back down south and persuade others, colleagues like Alice Roberts, for example, Alice president Roberts, president of Humanist UK. <laughs> Alice needs to come up here and give you a talk as well. Excellent, absolutely fantastic. Thank you once again, Jim. My pleasure. My Cheers. pleasure. Cheers, Stephen. I thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. So I study physics with philosophy. Oh. So for me, that was very familiar. We have an now. expert in our midst. I'm liking that. <laughs> um, you know. But yeah, it was really good. It was a really nice sum up of a lot of different areas. Which, Excellent. And Excellent. It, very accessible as well. Good. And do you have a message for the humanist group who organised tonight's event? Um, I think just keep doing what you do. And I think it's a very positive thing to tell people that they have free will because obviously people behave in that way anyway. And so to say that they don't is a very destructive, um, is a very destructive mechanism really. And so I think that, you know, humanists all around is a great way to be because we don't need a higher power to do good. We do have good within us. Good on you. And finally, what would your message be tonight after the talk to Jim? What's your message to Jim? Um, I don't know really. I'd, I'd quite like to pick his brain a little bit more. Um, well, this is on YouTube. He should watch it. So if you ask him a question now, maybe he'll type in the answer under the YouTube video. I would quite like, because I, what I was thinking of is that perhaps we could take an analogy of the quantum mechanical wave function and say that if that analogy is uh, like the human brain, then we, we do, in a sense, have a, a sense of free will in the unpredictability sense, because if it's like the wave function, then there is a degree of uncertainty at all times. Excellent. Now, that is a great finish, because that means we will check whether Jim Al-Khalili watches his it's own YouTube video. Thank you very much. Thank you. Me. Thank you. I think, Jim, you're on the right track, because you are entertaining your audience at the same time that you're informing them and making them think. Excellent. And finally, do you have a message for the organisers, the humanist group who organised tonight's event? Yes, uh, congratulations. I hadn't expected so many people to come mm. and I think it's very good to have um, given publicity to the humanist organisation by having such an excellent speaker. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it was fascinating. Um, some of it I'm going to have to think about when yeah, I get home. Yeah. Google so, a little so is bit. He. So is he. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, f funny in parts. Um, yeah, mind expanding. Yeah, really interesting. Glad I came. Good. Yeah. And so, do you have a message for him after tonight's lecture? Because oh he's going gosh. to watch this YouTube video, obviously. Oh my gosh, do I have a message for yeah, him? Yeah, message for Jim. Um, <sighs> Well, the guy who summed up yes. what, the, what the lecture was all yeah, about, that's yeah. quite, that's, that was quite a nice way to end it, it. so maybe Jim could take a few tips from, from the positivity <laughs> bit, yeah. He should, he should <laughs> maybe, bit. maybe have him as his wingman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. He could do the world warm-up and, and then the sort of end <laughs> bit, yeah. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I thought a great deal of it, but, but then again, I've got a bit of a background going way back in physics, so, I was able oh. to, so, so a lot of what you said was put, put into context for me. So, so, so you really actually understood most of what he was saying? Not, no, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah because he, he was did. talking to a lay audience. If he'd gone into the maths, it's all gone now. That's yeah, it, but, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And I was never very good to begin with, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it was a fascinating insight, and, and also a good counter to the no free will 
Yeah. Um, therefore, we can do what we like, you know, because the consequences for the judicial system would be quite severe in a strictly deterministic world. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it was good to have that, uh, have an answer to that. So Excellent. yeah, it was fascinating. Good. Yeah. And what would your uh, what would your message be, if any, for the uh, humanist group that organised tonight's event? Well. Uh, um, Greater Manchester is, is, is one, of, one of the humanist groups I align with. I mean, they're a very strong group. Um, they, my, my message to them would be, you know, um, you obviously can do things at scale with national figures, keep on doing things at scale with national figures, because it gets, it gets the Greater Manchester Humanist and Humanist UK wider, uh, uh, more widely known, and especially within universities where young people are. If you go to our conferences, the demographic is tends not to be so more young. to not, not so, so young, young. <laughs> not so young. So yeah, keep, keep doing it and keep Excellent. doing it at scale. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, you Cheers. I thought it was fascinating, really impressive and interesting. Excellent. Yes, well, I, I thought more or less the same, but I'm afraid I didn't altogether understand it because I didn't have much free knowledge, actually. So you. what I want to do is to uh, try and learn a bit more about it. Exactly. I've got news for you. Jim doesn't understand it either. Oh, right. No, he just makes it, makes it up as he goes along. <laughs> so, do you have a message for the, any message for the, the humanist group who organised tonight's event? Oh, yes, well done. It was yes. fantastic. Yes, Wonderful exactly. event. Yes, well done, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah. Thank you both very much Thank indeed. You. I thought it was very thought-provoking. Um, I'm going to have to spend some time digesting what he said and thinking about what that means for me um, and yeah it, it'll take a while I might have to if it's going on YouTube I might be watching it's it definitely again going then on I might YouTube. need to watch it again to have another, <laughs> have another go round and it's, another thing it's going on YouTube and you're in it <laughs> uh, so next question is uh, do you have a message for the humanist group who organized tonight's event uh, yes, uh, just to say thank you, and um, it was a, a fascinating event, um, lots of thought-provoking issues raised, and um, lots of opportunities to go away and think about what that means. Excellent. And final question for either or both of you is, what's your message for Jim after tonight's talk? Mm. Maybe it's time to go for a pint. Yay! <laughs> Good response. Yes. Um, Thank you both. How, how about how about um, the world is predictably unpredictable, unpredictably predictable, predictably predictable, and unpredictably unpredictable. You see, I like that. That's multiple choice. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Thank